I'm Dr Andy Hickson here with Bully Box TV on location in Coventry, the city of peace and reconciliation. I'm here with Jeff Thompson and Jeff, thank you for agreeing to talk with us today. It's a pleasure. Jeff, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, particularly for the, the viewers maybe that uh, don't know you? Yeah, I'm, I was born in Coventry. Um, I was working in factories in Coventry till the age of 32 working as a nightclub doorman. Um, I left conventional employment in 1992, became a full-time martial arts instructor, writer, buccaneer. <laughs> um, and, and now my job is uh, writing and talking to people, that's it. All I do is sit in my essence. I, I live a, an amazing, beautiful life. Buccaneer? What, what's a buccaneer? It's someone that does all the things he wants to do. Okay. I've located, you know, they, they have that saying, they say 80% of what you get is, comes from 20% of what you do. Well, I've located that 20% and I just marinate in that. That's all I do. Everything outside, uh, farm out to other people who are very good at that. Okay. So I, I'm, my dharma uh, is to pass on the elixir of my experience. I've had a lot of experience um, and I found a lot of essence and my dharma is to pass it on to people to be the proof that potential is possible. 300 bloody street fights. Mm, yeah. yeah. Undefeated? Well, when you say, when you say it like that, it, mm. it, sounds like, um, it sounds like you're bragging. 300 street fights happened because I was massively insecure. Mm. It wasn't my best game. And undefeated only because I never really came up against anybody you know, there was lots of people I know who were much more capable than me. Mm. So my claim to fame isn't that I was in those fights. My claim to fame is that I was in thousands of violent situations mm. and I collected essence from that. And the essence okay. was that violence is futile. Definitely, unequivocally, I have no doubt about that. I'm the proof. Mm -hmm. So I, you, I, I, would, I, would, I would use that only in as much as I say that's not the place to be because violence, even when it's well intended, rebounds on you. What I've recognised is that we've got something like 100 trillion, I think 100, 100 billion cells in us and they're all microcosms of us. So there's a, we're in charge of something like 100 billion cells and each one of those is driven by perception. Um, and if I'm, if I'm violent to you or I'm violent to somebody else, a hundred trillion cells waiting for instruction are infused with violence. So I can't be violent to other people without being extremely violent to me. Mm. And that's in, in very real terms. You know, if I've got adrenaline and anger, my body's going to fill with cortisol. Cortisol is a caustic. It, it attacks the smooth internal muscles like the heart, the lungs, the intestines, the bladder. It kills brain cells. It scratches arteries. The fatty acids that are released in fight or flight get caught up in the arteries uh, and you know it creates angina. We're, when we're angry um, and aggressive and violent and envious, all of those vices, we think we're in a place of, place of power but we're actually destroying ourselves. So I refuse to have any of that in my life. So um, that the whole idea of being in the fights was I, I went into all those fights and I created those situations because I had a perception that the world was dangerous. And I had a perception that the world was dangerous because at the age of 12, I was sexually abused by a man I idolized. Um, and I guess I was in a hypnagogic state with this guy. So everything he said was truth. I didn't question it, I didn't challenge it. So when he implicitly said to me, the world can't be trusted, not even the people you love, especially the people you love, that became my perception. And of course, reality is just perception. Um, so I went out into the world and I developed the skills, all the war paint, all the working scars, mm -hmm. uh, all the body armour, the ability to kill people in 60 languages. And I went out into the world and I, I went out in the world to defend myself against an enemy that only existed on the level of perception. But I created it in three dimensional terms. Hundreds of fights, thousands of violent situations, fights in nightclubs, pubs, Fights at christenings, fights at weddings. Everywhere I went, there was violence. Every room in my house, I had a weapon. Everything I read was violent. My conversations were violent. My relationships were violent. Everything I did, at, at a subtle level and at a gross level, was violent. And I was so immersed into that that I became it. 
mm. and everything in my life was produced by that. So it was very, it was damaging, but also hugely inspiring because it was like, if I can turn this around, if I can change perception, then I can uh, create a utopia. I can create a, a great reality, which I have. Mm -hmm. So I recognise from being all those situations that at a metaphysical level, I created it from a perception. And the only way to change that perception was to trace the bubbles back mm -hmm. and confront this man, which I did in plays and writing and actually in person, I met him in person and forgive him. Mm -hmm. But not forgive in the sense of letting people off. When you say forgive the man, you mean the man that abused you? The man that abused yes. me, yeah. Mm -hmm. So not in the sense of letting him off. I haven't got the power to do that mm -hmm. because, you know, this is a reciprocal universe and there's no doubt about that. Um, and he's got to, he's got to uh, face the consequences of his own actions, his own karma, his own cause and effect, which he did. I mean, eventually he killed himself, so he, he, ended, he ended his life very miserably. Mm -hmm. But when I met him, I forgave him, and in forgiving him, I exercised him from my cognition, from my perception. It was the most... People, people think I'm a great bloke because I was in hundreds of fights. I was in hundreds of fights because I was insecure, not because I was strong. Um, I'm, I'm a great bloke because I was able to forgive this person and exercise him from my perception. And when I exercised him from my perception, my conscious net expanded exponentially. So I've gone from working in factories, sweeping floors, to sitting at the BAFTAs, Johnny Depp there. I, mean, I have to move my wife's chair so she can't see him. <laughs> uh, my whole reality changed. My, my whole reality consists of M wonderful moments like this in wonderful places like this most of my my living comes from talking to people over tea and cake that's the, the change of perception um, it's not just a metaphor it literally changes reality so yes that's true about all those fights and it was a long time ago um, and, and I'm not ashamed of it because it, you know when I was there I believed that was I believed that the world was dangerous and that I had to protect myself um, but now I know that um, the only person I need to trust um, is me. Is yourself. Good. Can I just take you back in time? Yeah. Uh, where you were fearful. Yeah. And I remember reading about you creating a fear pyramid. Yeah. A pyramid of your fears or steps of your fears. And you found a way to step up the pyramid to overcome yeah. each of your fears. And at the top was this fear of violence. Yeah. So that's what took you into being a dormer, is yeah, that right? Yeah, yeah. So would you just like to talk to us what it was like climbing that pyramid and how you managed to overcome each of the fears and maybe some of the fears that you overcame? Yeah, well initially I, had, I was plagued by depression. Every time I wanted to do something creative, this internal sub-vocalisation, this internal voice would say, not for the likes of you don't get above your station, you're not anybody, don't forget you're not worth anything. Mm -hmm. Even the person that you idolised abandoned you. So I had this very powerful perception that I wasn't worth anything. So every time I tried to create, I, I became root bound. So my energy <coughs> turned inwards and I had terrible depressions. And these plagued my life. I didn't understand at the time that they were linked to all of these early experiences. Mm -hmm. So I decided after this one particular depression, I decided that I can't live like this anymore. I can't live under, under the dominion of these feelings. So I decided in the middle of a depression to write down everything I was afraid of on a pyramid, least fear at the bottom, worst fear at the top, and systematically climb the pyramid to gain desensitization to adrenaline or to fear. Ultimately, I, naively, I thought I'll get rid of fear. Yeah. But what I was doing, at, at a psychological level, was I was getting desensitization to adrenaline. At a metaphysical level, it was a shamanic exercise in collecting power from trauma. I was actually going to all the places where I was most afraid. Mm -hmm. These are the places that Gurdjieff would call the chief features. The areas where we're most afraid is the areas where we've got most treasure. The darkest point is where we access the greatest light. So rather than orchestrate my life and orchestrate my physiology, to put buffers around these things I didn't want to look at. I broke the buffers down, I got rid of the defence mechanisms, and I started to look at them, as the Quran said, little by little, not all at once. Incremental steps. Incremental steps. Mm. Um, and I started to uh, challenge them and inquire into them. What is this fear? What is this feeling? Mm. Ultimately, I realised there was I wasn't really afraid of violence. 
I wasn't afraid of being hit or being hurt or being left or being abandoned. I was afraid of the feelings that it evoked. Okay. Um, and the feelings came from a perception. So I traced it right back to the root. If I can change the perception, I can change the reality. So I started to climb the pyramid. Um, my initial fear was the fear of spiders. Okay. And it doesn't seem like much, but if there was a spider in the room, I wouldn't go to sleep. Mm. Um, then I had a fear of the dentist, I had a fear of going into karate competitions. But up until that point, my fear wasn't of karate competitions, my fear was of admitting I was afraid of going into karate competitions. Okay. So I couldn't even admit that I'd got a fear. Mm. I'm not really afraid of it, I just don't want to do it. Yeah. I could do it, but I just don't want to. Um, so there was lots of denial, lots of buffers and defence mechanisms. So as I started to climb the pyramid, um, and collect the power from my fears because the, as the Kabbalah says, the, the, you know, our power is locked into our fears and addictions. Mm. As I was able to confront these fears and observe them without identification, observe them without engaging, just sit in them, the, the, the nature of the fear was liberated and the effulgence that was left, the energy that was stored there came across. So my observer, my conscious net, mm. my courage grew as my fears diminished. So as I started to climb, I went from having a fear of sp spiders uh, right the way up to having a fear of, uh, to confronting a fear of violence. So I went from being afraid of changing jobs, afraid of change generally, mm -hmm. afraid, of, uh, afraid of spiders to uh, working in an area where people were trying to kill me. So I, went, I, I, I used these techniques, we, people talk about pragmatic spirituality this is pragmatic spirituality where where the techniques you do actually work in the real world so I went I was able to exist in a world where people threatened to kill me and it was a very real threat four of my friends were murdered two of them were assassinated it was a very real threat so it, it was hugely pragmatic very pragmatic so I built I climbed up this pyramid I had a fear of violent confrontation or I thought I did I didn't really, I had a fear of uh, the feelings that it evoked. So I became a nightclub doorman to overcome those fears. And then for a period got lost. I think it was Nietzsche that said, um, be careful when you hunt the dragon, that you don't become the dragon. Be careful when you look into the void, because it's going to look back. So I became hugely violent myself. I was propelled at that particular time, not so much by my ego, but by my by what Freud would call the superego or the internal parent or, or a perception on the internal parent. So I was, I'd, suddenly, I'd suddenly gone from being this man that was afraid of the world to a man that was standing in a very localised but powerful situation. Um, and it, you know, my ego fed off it for a little while and I became violent myself. I became a bully. Mm. I would never have accepted that at the time. Yeah. It was only when I became more and more violent and, and, and started to realise what I was doing, I started to question that. So for a long period, I went off on the wrong path. Fear. You talk a lot about fear. You talk a lot about adrenaline. Yeah. And the link between adrenaline and fear. And one of the things that you recognised in your life about uh, thinking, once I've overcome this fear, I'll have conquered fear. Yeah. But as we both know, I, I think, is that fear is always going to be there. It's about how we deal or channel the fear into other energies. Yeah. In fact, for a lot of things we do, fear is an important part of energising us, yeah. I, would, I would suggest. I am very interested in the link between fear and adrenaline. Mm. And one of the things that you have mentioned is that some people mistake uh, an adrenaline dump or an adrenaline rush for fear. Yeah. So my question is, what is the difference between fear and an adrenaline rush? I think the difference is between uh, a normal adrenaline rush, which you know sometimes we need, sometimes it's good, it's a, an energy source, um, but it's really only supposed to be there in life and death situations if we have to run a, a quick hundred yards or we have to fight for our life. Other than that, 
um, it can be very destructive, especially if we haven't got some kind of behavioural release for it. So most people get adrenaline every single day for deadlines, because a car backfires or because they've got stress in the relationship. So the body's getting lots of adrenaline for fight or flight, but they're not getting a behavioural release for it. And because they're not getting a behavioural release for it, you know, they're not finding that there's, there is no fight or flight, in other words. Mm. That adrenaline is still running around the body looking for a war. What's it going to do? The body goes into sympathetic nervous system for this stress. Um, the, there, is, there is no actual fight or flight. So the body eventually comes back to um, pa the parasympathetic nervous system, to homeostasis, to balance. But what's happened with all that adrenaline? It's still in the body. Mm. If we don't find a behavioural release, that adrenaline, the cortisol, roams around the body and, uh, and attacks, attacks itself. So it becomes an internal caustic. So we have to find a way of um, recognising that most of our fear is neurotic. Um, we've got to find a way to stop, to stop it coming out, you mm. know, to change our perception of it. Um, and if we are getting a lot of adrenaline, we've got to find a way to behaviourally use it. So if I get adrenaline for my job because I've got a deadline, but there's no actual fight or flight, so the adrenaline is not released. I have to find a surrogate release so I can cleanse my body of all this stress. So if I go for a run or hit the punch bag or do some martial arts, I can find a physical release for a physical syndrome. So it's recognising that uh, if someone tries to mug me or if I have to you know, run away from an aggressor, that adrenaline is very important. It should be now and again. At, at the moment in society, people are marinating in in the release of adrenaline all the time. The danger with it is, is that when we get an adrenal rush, the immune system closes down, um, blood's drawn away from all the non-vital areas, areas that are seen as non-vital in fight or flight, like the brain, it goes to all the major muscles. So most people are continually preparing for a fight and a flight that is not gonna happen. Okay. So their immune system's always closed down, that's why there's so much illness, which is related to stress. Mm -hmm. People are always displacing. Um, so, if I get uh, if I get adrenaline today, um, but it's not released, um, and then I get adrenaline tomorrow and it's not released, and then someone cuts me up in the car, boom, massive displacement. I displace it in all sorts of inappropriate ways. Maybe in the family, maybe in the car, maybe at work. Especially, we tend to we tend to displace it around the people we love, and then we blame them. We don't know why we're so angry. We're so angry because we've got a huge build-up of adrenaline that hasn't found a release. Okay. So at some points we have to, at some point we have to find a way of slowing our life down, um, finding exercises like qigong or tai chi or yoga that uh, actually trigger the parasympathetic nervous system so the adrenaline just isn't triggered so much. Literally slowing our life down with everything we do so we don't get so much stress um, and taking all the, areas of our, all the areas of our life where there is a massive amount of stress, mm. reducing it. And if we have got stress, making sure that we use it. We either, we either um, find a physical release to get rid of it, you know, or, or find a way to channel it. But it is a physical syndrome, and if we've got lots of stress and we're not managing it, then it's gonna create massive problems in the long term. Okay. Is it only possible to get rid of a buildup of adrenaline in a physical way? Uh, t to be honest, yeah. You, you, I mean, you can channel the energy into other things and create other things. You can channel it into work, but it is a physical syndrome, so it does need an explosive release. Yeah. It needs a fight or flight, and if we haven't got one, then we have to create one. We have to find a surrogate one. So, I, I, a lot of a lot of my old anxieties, I've always channeled into my work, and I've, I've become prolific because of it. Mm. But there is still a physical syndrome. We are in a we are in a body. We have physiology. We have biology. So we, uh, we have to find a way to manage this adrenaline. If we have a lot of adrenaline in our life, then we should be either playing squash or, or running or doing something to release it. It's, it's only when the cortisol stays in the body. Mm -hmm. um, I think in psychology they call it gas, the general adaption syndrome. If we get adrenaline, the body goes into sympathetic nervous system. There's no fight or flight. We come back to our homeostasis, but the adrenaline is still in the body. Eventually, if we don't find a release for it, it builds up and builds up and builds up. And the tiniest thing, the ring of a phone, will get your adrenaline going. Yeah. So we become sympathetic sensitive. And that's when people go, in, again in psychology they call this going over the edge mm -hmm. of the inverted U hypotheses. Which sounds convoluted, but it basically, if you imagine a U shape, 
and they say stress on this side of the U is healthy, it's good for you, it can mm -hmm. drive you, as you said. Yeah. When you get to the peak of the U and over the peak, stress can become very detrimental. So if we go two or three digits over there, um, you know, we almost can be on the verge of a breakdown because stress can quickly um, you know, create exhaustion, it can create breakdown, it can create depression and eventually it can create psychosis and at the very bottom end when we lose control of the Pressure sub vocalization, yeah, we, we can get, you know, people get schizophrenic because yeah. they lose control of all their sub vocalization. So it's recognizing when we've got too much stress in our life mm -hmm. and that's when we have to make decisions, we have to pull ourselves back to the to a healthy aspect again. Mm -hmm. Now one of the things that adrenaline produces as well as being a productive thing can also if you get a huge rush of adrenaline it can all almost cause like a, a freeze mm. um, much like you might see rabbits in a headlight just not knowing what to do <clears throat> how does one prepare for that in difficult situations of conflict that's a great question and it's it's the one question that most people don't want the the real answer to um, and the real answer to that is the only way you can become desensitized to those feelings is to be exposed to those feelings. Okay. So what I did was I recognized that when I had the feeling, it overwhelmed me, you know, it froze me, it made me want to retreat. My flight instinct was so strong, I wanted to run away. But I was running away from, I was always running away from my potential. I wasn't really running away from um, aggressive situations. And I was, wasn't ever afraid, as I said, of people. I was afraid of the feelings. Mm. So I was only afraid of the feelings because I wasn't used to feeling the feelings. So I started to create training sessions that evoked those feelings to bypass the conscious mind. So we could do, say, an animal day session or you could get to someone to do... An, an animal day session is where there's no rules. Okay. Or you could do uh, like in martial arts or you could do get someone to do some public speaking. Or get any, anything where you feel fear. Basically mm -hmm. get them to... Um, talk about the things they're afraid of and then confront situations in their life that will give them a similar feeling. So the feeling of someone bullying you, that tremendous amount of fear, isn't any different to the feeling of going and doing a public talk. It's, mm -hmm. the, same, it's the same release of adrenaline. But, but I mean, on a, on a, it, that's great. But on a, a practical level, I'm, I'm thinking now of a teenager in school, yeah. for example, that maybe is getting regularly beaten up. Yeah. Are you saying to him that because he, maybe he's afraid of of, yeah. of 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 getting bruises on his face, of getting his nose broken? Yeah. Are you saying to him that he needs, in order to deal with that fear of having his nose broken, of getting his nose broken until he's not scared of it anymore? Um, so what I'm saying is that he needs to recognise that the the feelings are in him, mm. and it's it's very real. It's in the school playground. It's very real. But if, if he's able to change his perception of that, first thing he needs to realise is that he's not the only person in the world feeling like that. Yeah. Everybody feels like that. The prophets, the kings, they all feel like that. So he's not on his own. The greatest people of our species felt like that. Even people like Mandela were so afraid that he turned to violence. He became a terrorist because he was afraid. Mm -hmm. And then when he realised the futility of that, he turned it around. So first of all, you're not on your own. Mm. Secondly, if you're able to look at it differently, it's a gift. It's a gift, because when I was bullied at school, I was terrified of going to school, but I just kept thinking, I'm going to keep turning up. I was terrified, and I wanted to run away. I'm going to keep turning up. Mm -hmm. And it set me on a path of learning. I thought, I'm going to go and learn martial arts, and I'm going to go and I'm going to take my life out, and I'm going to learn how to overcome this. So it can be a real gift. It can be the universe prodding you in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So if you're being bullied, and you're getting that's happening to you every day, within that restriction, there is a direction follow the direction and the direction will be uncomfortable but you're not going to avoid that comfort if you're on the school playground and you're being bullied now and you don't t turn into that you don't embrace it you don't mm. confront it you don't bring it to light you know you should tell the teachers you should you should do anything you can you can do to overcome it that's going to follow you for the rest of your life it's going to be in the workplace it's going to be in the relationships mm. what i'm saying to people is whether it's on the school playground or whether it's climbing out of a dugout and going into no man's land or whether it's getting out of a bad marriage or creating a new business you are going to bump into this feeling so if you're getting in the playground and you're getting it early I know this is difficult to hear but it's a gift yeah. it's a gift 
go out, buy the books, you know, uh, take the lessons, do everything you can to manage this fear. When you don't, when you can control this fear, nobody will be able to bully you. But life will always put, always put stuff in front of you to try and stop you. And it's we, it's us that do our own bullying. So like, you've got to take some responsibility. For you've that got, yourself, you've got to, you've got to take full responsibility mm. for it. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that what this person is doing right is right, and it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be stopped. You should still talk to the teachers. You should still expose it. You should still do all the things that we're told to do. Mm. But ultimately, we've got, we've got to take the responsibility to go out and set ourselves on a path of learning so that doesn't keep happening for the rest of our life. Because yeah. if, if I had not stood up to my bullies when I was at school, and I did run away a lot of times, if I didn't stand up to my bullies, if I didn't go out and develop the skills to stand up to my bullies, I wouldn't have been living the life I live now. Yeah. But ultimately, the bully, the external bully, doesn't exist. It's always about what it makes you feel and, and how you feel inside. So if you're at home and you're full of terror because you don't want to go to school, I completely empathise with that. Mm. And I'm not saying that it's not real. I'm saying it's not real, but I'm saying when you're there, it's terrifying. Yeah. But you can overcome it. There are things you can do. So you have to go out and you have to find those things. That's what you have to search for. But you're not on your own. Mm. You're not on your own. Everybody has it. Nobody escapes it. It's the human condition. And if we can manage those feelings, if we can, can, if we can captain those feelings because that's all sensual body stuff, we can go out and we can create any reality we want to create. No one said that dealing with violence and bullying was easy. It takes, as you... Massive amount of, massive work amounts of courage, and yeah. Effort, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and courage, courage, yeah. I believe that dealing with bullying is, is, is not just about the person that's getting bullied. I mean, there's at least two people in the process, yeah. possibly more. You've got the, the, the person that's getting bullied, you've got the bully, you've got bystanders or people that yeah. observe, witness the bullying. To effectively deal with bullying or to find strategies to deal with the bully, I think it's important that we need to understand the bully. Mm. We need to get inside their heads. We need to understand what makes a bully tick. Yeah. Now, with your own words on your journey in life you've seen two sides of a bully you've 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 become a bully yourself at yeah. one point yeah and you've also had to deal with a lot of bullies yeah so just bearing that in mind how do bullies see weak people well bullies are afraid yeah. bullies are massively insecure and you see them on the playground and you see them in politics you see them, you know, running little groups in the playground. You see them running countries. Mm -hmm. So the microcosm and the macrocosm are the same. So they're everywhere. But they're, it's always about insecurity. It's always about massive insecurity. It's about the need for control. Uh, I think I said to you, I was working with Mandela's bodyguard. Mm -hmm. And he said when he was in prison, he was bullied and tortured by the guards. And when he realised that these bullies were working from conditioning, that they didn't really know what they were doing, mm. they, it was unconscious, um, and, and uh, that some of them were was, was so young they couldn't have known what they were doing. When he realised it was all coming from conditioning, he was able to forgive them, he was able to, he was able to understand and let it go. Okay. And because he was able to understand that they were hugely insecure people, anybody that bullies, anybody that bullies is insecure. And he might have an armoury around him to protect that, but at the core of it he's insecure. Um, so once we understand that, it helps us to see it's not personal. Yeah. These, these people um, are working unconsciously. It doesn't mean they're not dangerous, because they are dangerous, mm -hmm. but it means it's unconscious. So it's easier to understand it, it's easier to forgive it. Um, but it's, and it's also easy, when I look back at my past and people thought I was a great fighter and I was very confident, I was a bully. I was a bully because I was afraid of the world. I believed the world was dangerous, so I used to, I used to very subtly bully to keep some control mm. but if anybody ever stood up to that bully and it fell apart okay. it didn't actually exist it just needs one person and I had an example of this when I was at school we had a, we had a, a bully called Dennis and he was a real proper look, look like Dennis the Menace you know okay. he was a real everyone was terrified of him because he would fight anybody I remember watching him in the playground one day grab this young kind of posh kid mm. who was in a working class school so this kid was quite posh and you know, kind of tried to rough him up. And this kid said to him, 
you think I'm afraid of you? He said, but I'm not afraid of you. Mm. And this Dennis was like flustered and he went, oh, look, he's not, he's not afraid of me. And he goes, I'm not afraid of you. He said, I'll fight you anytime. I'm not afraid of you. And this bully absolutely fell apart. Mm. I've never seen such courage. This guy, had, this, this lad had such presence. We were 12, mm. such presence. And I've seen it, I've seen it with one of the biggest gangsters in the country as well. Mm. Um, looked at a guy in the gym and the guy was, you know, like a maybe 11 stone. And this guy was massive, a proper, I won't say his name, but he was mm. a proper well-known gangster. And he said to the guy, what are you looking at? And he says, actually, I'm looking at you. You know, and he says, you know, I'll, he said, I'll rip your head off. And he says, well, why don't you step outside and try that? Mm. He says, because I'm not afraid of you. And of course he would have had adrenaline. He'd have had all that, mm. but this, I mean, and this guy I'm talking about was a fearsome, legendary character, and this guy fell apart because he stood up to fear. Mm. We visit a lot of schools all over the country and, and in many other countries, helping people find strategies yeah. to deal with bullying on an everyday basis, and also listening to all the ideas out there that are shared with us. Now, one of the most common ways we get from parents, particularly of, of children that have, have been bullied themselves, is they'll say, well, just hit them back and they'll stop bullying you. Or something I've heard quite a lot, get a brick, if somebody bullies you, get a brick, smash it in the bully's face. Mm. Now this is dads telling their sons to do that. What would you say to a dad that suggests that as an effective strategy to deal with bullying by putting a brick in the face of the bully? I would, I would just say that it's a short-term measure. Um, but basically, it, if, you do, if you suggest that, uh, and I can see how tempting that is, but if you suggest that, basically you're, basically you're giving your child a strategy to deal with um, violence for the rest of their life. So for the rest of their life, they will deal with... They will deal, they will, use violence as a problem solving tool so mm. it's it's the worst thing you can give them but i understand it yeah it's the worst thing you can give them if we if we try to get rid of violence with violence which is a level it's a level that we've got to accept it's a level that happens and sometimes if we're at a level of consciousness it might be the only thing that gets us through that moment mm. so i'm not dismissing it but i'm just saying it's a very short-term problem solving tool later on when you're in the workplace that won't work yeah. that won't work across the negotiation table in business it won't work in marriage it destroys everything mm. violence destroys everything so we've got to encourage kids to lift themselves up and make that below their game this is very difficult because this this kind of this concept of lifting the uh, lifting ourselves up to a higher game um, is where the species is going but it's not where we're at at the moment the whole world is in a in, is in a place of using violence to solve violence. That's what's happening in Russia, that's what's happening in Afghanistan. Our governments at the moment are using violence to solve violence. Yeah. So we're trying to teach kids to find a higher level of consciousness and our governing bodies can't do it. So I'm aware that in the evolutionary uh, ascent, we are somewhere between um, we're somewhere between Genghis Khan and Kissinger. You know what yeah. I mean? We're somewhere between you know, sheer violence and, and negotiation. There are people out there that are trying to, trying to, uh, you know, work, people like Mandela working from forgiveness mm. and, you know, people like the Dalai Lama and that they're all, they're all trying to lift people's levels of consciousness. But we still have to recognise that at a certain level of consciousness, people are going to be solving problems, uh, solving physical problems physically. Mm. Um, but it's a very short term solution. So I would say it's, it's the worst tool you can give them. I would say, I, and I'm, I'm kind of, well, it's almost difficult for me to say because I can understand how they feel. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, going back to the, the parent yeah. that suggested the brick. So let's, we've told them it's not a good idea. Are there some non-violent ways that you could suggest to him to deal with bullying? in school yeah don't, the biggest thing is it can't be a secret we're as sick as our secrets if we yeah. carry it as a secret and we hold it and we don't tell people it's going to grow inside of us so the thing is if there's someone bullying us expose it the more people that know about it the better expose it to light what we expose to light becomes light so we tell the teacher we tell the parent you know we tell um 
whoever needs to be told. Mm -hmm. So we get as many people observing the bully as possible and we bring the protection in through observation. So highlight it, don't, you know, again, but it comes back to the same thing. People are afraid to speak out because it's gonna happen more, but the only way to do it is to bring it to light. Mm -hmm. Tell as many people as possible, but we're not gonna get past the fact that at some point this kid has got to learn to control these feelings because they are they are his biology mm -hmm. and if he doesn't control these feelings wherever he goes in the world they're going to follow him so at some point we, we can do all that stuff and that's important but at some point we have to have the courage to look at these feelings and go okay I'm struggling with these feelings so I need to do something to control these feelings or to understand these feelings one of the big things I would say to parents is tell them that these feelings are normal mm -hmm. tell them that you feel these feelings People don't want to talk about fear, they don't want to admit fear. So you say to them, when I'm in the workplace, I feel these feelings. You know, when I'm, sometimes when I'm in the car and people cut me up, I feel these feelings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm, I've got to do a talk at work and I'm so afraid I want to run away. Mm -hmm. It creates an allowing for them. Give them lots of proof that you're not on your own. My biggest thing was, I used to say to people in the karate class, do you feel scared? And they go, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd go, well, it's just me then. Yeah. <laughs> it's just me, I'm the only person. And that was the, <laughs> the hardest thing. You felt, I felt like such a coward. I'm the only person. And if I spoke to my wife about it, she, she, had, she didn't have the articulation. You know, if I, if I spoke to people about it, they didn't want to admit it. I read books and, and I thought, I'm going to get answers. And I'd pick up a book and it didn't give me the answer. Even the authors were too scared to say, yeah, I'm scared most of the time. Mm. Um, People are scared that admitting the fear that they feel is going to make them less of a person. Well, I've just written a, I've just written a film called The Pyramid Texts. It was mm. just a one-man film, um, basically about a guy in a gym, stood in front of a camera like this, mm. um, leaving an epitaph for someone he's estranged from, saying, these are the things I should have told you. He's saying to him, it's okay to be afraid. I'm afraid. Mm. I hid that from you because I didn't want to invite it in in greater proportions. Where we come from, warriors attack fear, but that's not good. So he gives him all the examples of it's okay to be afraid. Mm. This would be a great film actually for kids to look at because it's saying, look, everyone's mm. got this. What's it called? It's called The Pyramid Text. If, if, if people want to see it, how can they get it? Uh, well, we've not shot it yet. We're shooting it in four weeks. Okay. I've written it for an actor called James Cosmo mm. um, and we've just got the money together to do it. It's a micro budget, but it's going to be beautiful. So it's saying to them, giving them as many examples, any proof, Mm. Um, and you know they need proof that everything they want in the world is behind this line of fear and if they've been exposed to it very early it's a great sign it's a sign that they've got big things to do because mm. they're saying okay this kid's ready we're going to get him in front of this now he's going to look at it and then we're going to try and bring as much instruction as we can if they see that their heroes are afraid but they're working with it they'll be more encouraged to do it the worst thing is that we feel as though we're on our own mm.